G'day, guys. It is the coach here. Sorry, I'm laughing my backside off because Luke and I have had amazing discussion, a lot of banter before we kicked off. This is Talking Slanesh, and um, I'm really excited to talk about the Slanesh book because, unfortunately, Slanesh did cop not one nerf, not two nerf, not three nerf. They copped a whole bunch of beatings over the last six to 12 months, and they were the boogeyman. They're now not so much. I wanted to talk to Luke, who's been doing incredibly well in the Australian scene with Slanesh to talk about what the rules look like in 2020 and how he's making the most in his lists. Um, Luke Dorman, um, that was my really bad <laughs> Pommy accent. We tried to explain how he did it. That was horrible. But Luke uh, comes to us. He came, he's done really well in Australia. So he's gone, come 23rd at CanCon, which was uh, 220 players, came second recently in a tournament just this month. Um, Cinder 4 Gaming District um, had a tournament and he's also come 14th at SAGT. So uh, it's great to have someone of Luke's caliber talking us through the heated arts of Slanesh. Luke, g'day. G'day, mate. How are you going? Good. We're just having a laugh because Luke is wearing a New South Wales jersey. He is drinking a Queenslander beer, lives in Adelaide, but he's a pommy. So uh, <laughs> talk about gender, I said gender, identity confusion. <laughs> Well, you know, it's all the range these days. <laughs> How did you get into, I guess, Age of Sigma and why why Slanesh? Um, I'm really excited about this because I th I still think there's merit in the book. I think a lot of people with Slanesh have kind of, you know, are, are very, very sour. You know, they changed the depravity. They've made some of the things like the Keeper of Seekers more, more expensive. They've made these continual changes to the book, and I think some people have kind of put them on the shelves for a little bit. And the irony of uh, just recently, they've just had the, the Games Workshop announcement that the next box set is going to be Daughters of Cain and Slanesh. And, like, I was talking to Liam, and Liam's like, oh, man, I'm going to buy it. I wonder if someone wants to buy Slanesh. I'm like, no one no wants one, to buy Slanesh no. right now. Uh, basically, in our group in South Australia, everyone's been uh, trying to flog me, and I'm like, I've already got it, and no, thank you. No, thank you, you are the Necrons of Indominus. Everyone wants the Space Marines. No one wanted the Necrons. And if you're a Necrons player, you are laughing your well, backside off. Yeah, but... I, did like, I do like the Necrons, yeah. <laughs> but I still, I still think they've got merit. I still think they are competitive. Absolutely. I think they're good. I think they're not as what people would say is busted or broken or um, as bad of a bad time as some people had by always fighting last. So I don't think it's quite the time to put your toys away. But I think there's going to be some things you need to think about differently in order to get the most of them in the competitive scene. Luke, is that your assumption based off your last tournament? Yes, uh, the tools exist. Um, if you want to be highly competitive, the tools still exist because you've got a, a range and a wealth to draw from, from Slaves to Darkness, who uh, have some great stuff to stick in there. And... Uh, the abilities, the allegiance abilities can still score your win. Uh, there are a couple of very bad matchups, but they still can make it. I still uh, i am convinced I can take out first place, and we'll see how we go with that. But uh, I still think they can be up there with the uh, right pilot. Yeah, and I, I think so too. I think that uh, in the meta as well, maybe the return of shooting makes it a little bit harder for Slanesh. But I don't think that it's going to be the wooden spoon. You're going to be coming last because you don't have the tools. Uh, you're not Sylvaneth. Sorry, guys. Uh, yeah. If you're a Sylvaneth <laughs> player, you're not Sylvaneth. You're not Legions of Nagash. Uh, there is still merit, but there's still a, a little bit of uh, rethinking of how you build the list. No longer can you just put two or three Keepers of Secrets, a Lawnmower, no. and then you know three basic battle line. There's something different that we need to build into, into our lists. Absolutely. I mean, you... You can be a solid 3-2 army uh, in most tournaments, in my opinion, and you can push that up with some elevated play and favourable matchups, definitely. Which is where we want to be, you know. You want an army to be around that yeah. three three wins, two losses, and if you go 4-1 and one or 5-0, and oh, it's because of you as a player who's practised and skilled, not because the army's completely busted and you just push it up the board and yeah. Merry Christmas, yeah. you've, you've won a major tournament. Yes, absolutely, and I agree with that. Um, uh, for, fortunately, when I when I first started playing it, uh, I didn't get everything together until after the first FAQ. So I never had the pleasure of playing with the busted um, the busted summoning list. 
but uh, I'm sure it was pretty nasty at the time. It looks horrible, to be honest, but yeah. It was a bit nasty. I did play against yeah. it a few times. But the good news is, is you're going to talk us through some of your thinking. And before I get into that, I want to understand what drew you to Slanesh. You know, is it is it the sexy pink? Is it the um, <laughs> is it the claws? Like what 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 drew you to this army opposed to all the other armies? Uh, well, uh, I was an old school fantasy player in my youth, uh, growing up. Usual sort of story. Um, I mainly played Dark Elves and uh, Tomb Kings back in the day, but I always, always loved the uh, Diaz uh, Demonettes. Loved that model. Shame about the old uh, squid head and the old goat head. That was the uh, the thing that always put me off uh, collecting Slanesh. Uh, sold all my stuff, left uh, UK around about 8th edition. Always kept my eye on sort of uh, what's going on and uh, got back into it on AOS 2, picked up Nighthorn. But then uh, as soon as I saw the, the new Keeper, that was it. I was like, this is gorgeous. That's, that's this an incredible This is model. the most just... insane model. Oh, I just loved it. I loved every single sculpt that came out. And I was that was it. I'm on. I'm on. And uh, not only just that as well, I actually even got the uh, Creature Cast Keeper of Secrets, which is... One of the best models I've ever seen. I absolutely love that model as well. Uh, so for me, the aesthetics of it, and uh, I even have the old Diaz Demonettes. So I don't even have any of the, the new ones, just the old Diaz ones, because I I've love got that the four, model. I've got the fourth edition Crab Claw ones as well. So oh, God. I, I, have the, I, I have the Juan, the, Juan uh, the older style, and then the, even the older, older style with his yeah. absolute crab. Cr the old, the, the old fiends, the old fiends, they were something else, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, but de definitely aesthetics at first. Uh, well, when I saw how the army played, uh, I knew it was for me. Uh, I've always been a, a speed glass cannon sort of player, and uh, this was 100% my style, 100%. Yeah, uh, I, I, I've always been drawn by the the style um i was been i've been painting um uh, is it seleski the, yes, the two model yeah. the, the the two you know the guy Beautiful. and the girl on top yeah wonderful model and i think for me that's where i get drawn by slanesh so back in Warhammer fantasy days i talk about being an empire player for a long time but i had a little side detachment of zench and slanesh and yeah. i always loved slanesh because of the style it was so different and you've got this like beauty but also this pain and you've got these interesting colors things like purples and pink that yes, i wasn't normally using yeah. and you kind of blend it into skin color and you know there's there's some really interesting kind of design behind it that for me is why i I've, I've been drawn to slanesh never really played it in age of sigma but the the beauty of the sculpts i i, I think it'd be pretty hard to find more beautiful sculpts than this particular range yeah, they're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. Also, uh, the story, the, the idea of Slanesh is something that really appeals to me. I mean, even across the 4K universe, the old warm of fantasy, just the fact that the elves were so, you know, so, uh, you know, deprived and uh, disgusting and that it just, uh, the civilization just created Slanesh through pure hedonism. Uh, I don't know why that drew me to him, but uh, I just loved the story. I always thought it was great that they, they birthed this this ultimate, this being out of their own hedonism. So, uh, yeah, I always loved the story as well. I get the and feeling in, that. And, and also in Age of Sigma, sorry to interrupt, just the idea that the, uh, because I, like most people, I'm waiting for the Dark Elves. That's uh, when they do return. But just the idea the Elves have chained him up. That's that's fantastic. I absolutely love the storyline there as well. It's uh, pretty cool. Yeah, I, I will say that I'm waiting for hopefully fingers crossed the cult of Slanesh, the combination of Daughters of Cain, that would and, be and yeah. and Slanesh. They did it in Warhammer Fantasy Battles as like a bit yes, of like a yeah, Citadel did, yeah. journal. I would love them to. And I actually thought, funnily enough, that Warhammer Community Box was the launch. Of, yes, I thought that was going to be I the almost, launch of I the saw cult that of Slanesh. They've done. The, they've done it. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone uh, doesn't let's... know, it was a com it was a combination army that you could do that was Slanesh and what was the old Dark Elves, but specifically the Daughters of Cain, and basically yeah. that was actually an army. So um, then, fingers they, crossed. Well, yeah, I mean, essentially, Slanesh is the Elven Chaos God in my eyes. So for me, yeah, I love it. Absolutely love it. Love it. I that. get the feeling that that box set is going to mean that you guys are going to come back in a new form. So I don't think you're going to be 
three yeah. and chewing for long. But I want to talk about the allegiance. I want to talk about the terrain piece. I want to talk about two lists that you've provided to us. You've been kind enough to provide us two different style of lists that we're going to unpack. But before we unpack that, I want to get your understanding and really take me through a few things like depravity, take me through some of the logic behind depravity. Um, because depravity for me is, uh, it seems like a really simple mechanic, but there's some really good decision making that you need to go through in order to make the most of this resource because depravity is your primary resource. Yes, and uh, I have a magic number for depravity uh, that all Slanesh players should be looking to get, and that is uh, 28 depravity, which will get you... write that down, 28. That will get you two units of 10 demonettes. That's it? Is that what you get? That's what you get, and that's how you win games. That's how you win games. All right, so just to take a step back first. So uh, if I'm picking up Slanesh for the first time, I get this allegiance ability that is um, depravity. Uh, now, basically, depravity, what's going to happen is those depravity points, and, and you fill in the gaps or tell me if I'm wrong, the depravity points are able to summon units. So the way you generate depravity points is each time you cause a wound or a mortal wound on an enemy model made by an attack made by a Slanesh hero, or a spell cast by a, a, a friendly slanish hero. The model can't be slain though. So if you do a mortal wound on a regular Joe with one wound, you don't get the, the, the depravity. However, if you were to hit a Stormcast hero or an ogre or an orc who has multiple wounds, basically those wounds, not killing, will generate depravity if it's from a hero uh, spell or just, you know, by an attack. Yep, that's correct, um, yes. Yep, and then also when your heroes take damage but don't die. Yes. And there's a caveat, um, something that you need to be aware of when you're Slanesh players, you do not gain depravity from abilities. So... Um, What's an example instance, of an ability? So, so, so for instance, the, the chariot's uh, impact hits are an ability. You don't get depravity for that. You don't get depravity for that. Um I believe uh, the keepers, uh, uh, the uh, where the keeper offers uh, offers the gift to have plus one to attack, or, and if you don't accept um, the end of the combat phase, uh, you gain you take D three mortal wounds. That's not that's an ability. You don't gain depravity for that. Uh, is that so in the, the FAQ somewhere, or where where is that coming from? Uh, it's it's in the I believe it's in the uh, feast of depravities. And it, I said, think it is in the FAQ as well, I'm sure. Yeah, you, do, okay. you don't get it for abilities, I'm 100% sure, yes. Because it does say each time uh, the wound or a mortal wound is inflicted by an enemy by an attack. So it explicitly says an attack. Um, yes, which, not an ability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So, so that, you, that, you get, that's just something you've got to think about because uh, you can... Act, let's say, uh, probably at the start of the journey with Slanesh, maybe I will have, you know, accidentally taking some depravity for using that when uh, when then realizing afterwards you're not supposed to do that so that is something you got to think about as well all right so you're looking for attacks you're looking for spells by your slanish heroes yes. uh, as well as when your slanish heroes take a wound that is yep. not negated so if they take a, a deprav some type of ward save or if they're able to make their armor save they they don't count no they don't count uh, and also endless spells do not count either so with your depravity points, you're able to summon. Now I have, uh, for anyone who's watching on YouTube, I have uh, cut and paste the FAQ. So if you're looking at your battle tome and you're thinking, Anthony, these numbers don't match up to my battle tome, that is because they were FAQ'd and the points had changed. Some of them quite dramatically, but uh, basically they got more expensive to summon certain things. Yeah, absolutely. It was... Uh... This is the table I uh, basically have played with uh, the whole time I've been with Sunesh. Uh, as when I finished my collection, basically the FAQ dropped as soon as I was ready to start playing. So uh, after I'd finished painting. Luke, when we're playing together at a tournament or whatever it might be, 
are all of these units viable? Because I'm looking at this, you know, one keeper of secrets is 45 depravity points. Um, you've already, already obviously mentioned 28 is that magic number for 20 demonettes. You know, I can bring on five seekers for 15 points. There's obviously a whole bunch of demons you can summon for Slanesh. Yeah. Are they are they all worthwhile taking? Is there no. is there no. times that you think some are better? Like talk me through the the the, the thinking and the process and what becomes priority for you in different situations so so what you need to think about when you're a slanesh player is that you are going to be outnumbered you are going to be outnumbered and 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 from that if you play another smart player by turn three you're going to be behind on victory points because you've got more than likely less numbers than your opponent so you need to be in a position where you want to summon numbers on objectives towards the end of the game. is, And that's generally when you will win. So you want to be looking at the demonettes um, because um, basically, well, they provide numbers and objectives. And that, that's that's the best thing to summon. And I can't stress enough. Uh, they also get, if you need to make a charge for a tag onto an objective, they get a free reroll charge as well, which is also very effective. Even if you summon in 20 demonettes, you, know, you can dish out a little bit of damage and get that last couple of points at the end of the, the end of the phase and uh, win yourself the game. Um, other than that, summoning wise, uh, the only other things I've summoned really is, um, and this is a bit of a cheat, and that is the Forge World Keeper of Secrets or the Soul Feaster, which uh, actually only costs thirty depravity to summon on its War Scroll because it doesn't pile in and fight twice. That's quite a nice one to bring on. Um, summoned a couple of Seekers a couple of times. They've done okay. Uh, if you get them on early, that's fine because you can run off and capture an objective. But you, you've really got to think about capturing objectives. I mean, summoning, uh, summoning a Chariot, you know, it's okay. But it's by the time you've got that point, you need bodies and objectives by that point. And, uh, yeah, other than that, uh, there is a neat trick you can do with the summoning. Uh, you'll f summon a vice leader and then chain summon. If you need to get something to the other side of the board to jump an objective to win, uh, that's another effective way. But you, you're generally looking at Demon X for summoning. So let me, let me pause you there. There's two things I want to clarify. Um, first off, you mentioned that you will be outnumbered. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because this is what I see mostly in Slanesh lists, is that in the traditional 2,000-point battle, a lot more of your points are going towards heroes than the average list because that's how you're going to generate your depravity. So um, it, before General's Handbook 2020, you'd often see two, maybe even three Keepers of Secrets. You probably saw a good 1,000 points, maybe if not more, going into heroes because the more depravity you could generate early, the more summoning you put on the board, and then you essentially get a 2,500, maybe even a 3,000-point army through depravity. Is yeah. that is that where you're coming from when you say that you will likely be outnumbered? Yes, I mean just about uh, my Cancon army, for instance. I had seventeen models, seventeen models. That was it, and uh, sorry, eighteen models, eighteen models. I had two keepers and Archeon, three units of five Hellstriders. That was it. That's the whole army, and uh, I'm fight fighting legions in the gash, and they've got you know. Uh, 90 Grimgrass Reapers, you know, I'm outnumbered from the start. And uh, that's how you got, that's how you got to think. You've got to think that you're going to be behind on points and you've got to think, how can you get to the point by turn four and five where you can win the game and you win it through the summoning at the back half of the game. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the easiest ways to beat Slanesh is going to be to take out those heroes because the moment you take out those heroes, you deny the depravity, you deny the options where summoning might occur. So this is where you don't want to put all of your eggs in the hero basket and you don't want to take, you know, three battle line, you know, cheap battle line, but you do want to make the most of your allegiance ability. So really think about, and we'll obviously go through a couple of Luke's lists as an example. But think about how you can start maximizing it and what you're going to need to do. I can see some things here uh, are, are really good choices. Some of them you're probably like, oh, they're probably situational if it was required for a certain reason, on you know, a particular opponent or a particular yeah. uh, battle plan that you're playing. 
look, if you're having fun with your mates and uh, you, you just want to have a, a nice casual game, then uh, yeah, summon three fiends or something. That'll be cool and see what happens. Uh, but if you if you're looking to win a competitive game, then uh, you you're really looking at demon X and. If if you get lucky, a keeper as well. One of the two keepers. Uh, yeah, because leave, that's what leave, you need to leave, do. Yeah. Leave your fiends at home. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. <Simon>. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I haven't even bothered building mine, so that's how much I think of those uh, guys. So yeah. All right. So so that's the depravity. We'll talk a little bit more about lists in a minute. A couple of other things you're going to get by taking the allegiance is one, you uh, take the host of Slanish. So after you've choose chosen your Slanish allegiance, you must choose a host so your host could either be an invader a pretender or a god seeker so depending on which one you take is going to be a whole bunch of rules that will come with it i'm not going to dig into this one just yet because luke has provided two different lists in two different hosts and we'll talk about the host when we get there so we, so just know that you once you've chosen a host uh, slanesh you then need to choose either invaders pretenders or god seekers that's correct uh, two other things. Uh, well, one one I, I don't think I've ever seen used ever, which is the Euphoric Killers, which is the unmodified hit rolls uh, by a Chaos. Oh, actually, no, no, it's a light. Sorry, I was thinking it's a Chaos Spawn. I don't know why I'm losing the plot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm losing the plot. I'm like, I've never seen a, a Chaos Spawn from Slanesh. No. So the Euphoric Killers is the unmodified hit roll for the attack made by a melee weapon by a Chaos Slanesh model is a six. That attack inflicts two hits to the target instead of one, make wound and save rolls, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If the attack uh, model has has 20 or more models, it does three hits with an unmodified six roll. So you're basically going to double or triple your attacks on a dice roll of six by Chaos Slanesh. Talk to me about this rule. Uh, how, do you, how do you use it? Yeah, so it is actually quite an important rule. Um when combined with uh, a few abilities such as the Fane and um, uh, a couple of the Allegiance abilities, uh, mainly in Pretenders, um, it lets you go fishing for sixes, essentially, because sixes on the Keepers, that's where you want it. You want the sixes on the big claws that do five damage each, and then you're in, you, you know... You double. You can sometimes if you get lucky, you get a couple of sixes or, and and take it from me. Uh, the keepers of secrets are swingy, very swingy, and uh, the six just just one six can uh, brighten your smile up. I'll say that. Um, other than that, uh, they're very. It, it just adds that extra bit of uh, umph, extra bit of umph. I don't think I've ever had the uh, twenty demonets one. I don't think that's ever happened for me. Or if I have had twenty D minutes, and I've probably forgot that they do two hits each. Um, so, if, so it's, it's it's you if your unit is twenty or more models, not yeah. your opponent. You're not attacking a, a twenty or more models. No, it's you. It's you. You have to have other twenty models. Yeah, yeah definitely. And uh, what it is nice and tasty for again, if you reach into the pool of slaves to darkness, uh, it's very nice, especially for the big fella. Uh, Archeon, who uh, is looking to get a couple of extra sixes to hit with the old Sword of Judgment, get your opponent sweating then uh, when you're rolling to wound with uh, maybe six or seven dice. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, why Why my mind read chaos, chaos Spawn? I, I read Chaos Spawn, not Chaos Slanesh. <laughs> my mind is like three steps ahead and, and completely losing the plot. No, that is a good rule. That is a very good rule because it obviously rewards you for your battle line units if they're in a horde or they're going to reward you with your, your combat monsters. So, uh, re and then obviously that just creates more opportunity to, to generate depravity, especially yep. if you're, you know, you, you keep his claws doing five wounds, that's potentially five additional depravity off one six. That's pretty yep. sweet, sweet. Yeah. I, I mean, all the allegiance abilities go together so brilliantly. It's, uh, it really synchronizes nicely. The last one you're going to get is the 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 bane of most people's existence. <laughs> that is locus of diversion. So uh, locus probably needs no explanation. But if you are picking this up for the first time, or you're trying to understand how Slanesh is kicking your butt, 
It is because at the end of the charge phase, each friendly Hedonite's hero that's within six of an enemy can create a locus of diversion. If you do, uh, if they do so, pick one enemy unit that's within six of the hero uh, and then enroll a dice. Adding to if the Hidden Knight hero is a greater demon, so that we're talking about, um, we're talking about Seleski, we're talking about uh, the um, Keeper of Secrets, we're talking about the greater demon of Slanish. Are they the only greater demons? Uh, well, there's Exalted Greater Demon, but uh, that's what I'm thing. thinking of. Yeah. That's the, yes. the Forge World one. Yes, yeah. that's what I meant. Yeah. Not the Greater Demon, the Exalted. That's the Forge yeah. There's World an model. Exalted one, and um, yeah, there is a, a named character called the uh, Soul Soul Feaster as well. Which so if you got that, sorry, go on. Luke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Soul Feaster is the same model as the Exalted Greater Demon, and you can uh, well interchange them. But yeah, no. But the, the Greater Demon, they actually, it's interesting. The, the Exalted Greater Demon is completely different from the other keepers as well so uh we'll touch on that later but yeah so if your he hedonite hero rolls a four or your hedonite hero greater demon so we're looking for the keyword greater demon is a uh is a two plus uh because you do gain plus two uh if it's a greater demon basically what happens is after the players have picked uh sorry 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 that uh, that enemy a... unit fights at the end of the the, the combat phase so um, you can't pick the same unit as the target for the ability more than once in the charge phase. So whether it's successful or not, you've just got to pick a different unit. And basically it's either a four plus or a two plus, depending if it's a hero or if it's a greater demon hero. Just to clarify, a bit of wishful thinking there. It's, it's actually changed to a three plus now. And That's right. That was another FAQ. Heroes. That was the I first knew... nerf. And uh, yes, uh, <laughs> you do fail it a lot more these days. Definitely. So again, check out the FAQ. Yes, I 100% remember that. It is. It, w it was only a, a plus one, or it was. Yes. Yeah, it was. So basically, a three plus or a four plus, your opponent is fighting last. So that just means again, more depravity is coming your way. You're going to be able to do more damage. You're not going to take less damage from your opponent, and you're just going to generally annoy them by making them fight last. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is my favorite. Definitely my favorite uh, rule because. Uh... I'm not a nice person, and uh, <laughs> I enjoy enjoy the pain on their face. It's great to play a bit of psychological warfare with this as well. It's a bit of bit of poker going on because you can really say to your opponent, really get in their head and be like, "Look, I know you want to come in here, but I'm just going to remind you again: if I roll a three plus, you're fighting last, and then uh, yeah, I'm going to get to pile in three times and four times and probably kill you. So just just letting you know." Just letting you know, and it really makes opponents think twice about coming anywhere near you. Puts them off the game plan with their big bad units, and uh, yeah, it's a great rule. It's a jerk rule. Uh, you also get a terrain. You also get a terrain piece. Yes. Um, you also get a terrain piece that you get if you are a Legion Slanesh. Um, talk to me a little bit about the Fane, and then talk to me. Where do you put it? Like, what's again? What's some of the thinking behind where you put this terrain piece down? This is this is a difficult one because it's actually can be encumbering as well. Um, early on when I was playing, I was putting it in the wrong place at all times. It's got to be more than three inches away from other terrain as well. And you generally you want it next to your keepers. You want it next to a keeper that's gonna um, it's gonna prick itself, and then it gets to reroll its hits till the next to the end of the next phase or. If uh, Archeon, you've got Archeon in your uh, army and you want him to prick himself so he rerolls his hits. Uh, the problem is the bases are very big and there's a lot of terrain on the table. So sometimes it's worth just taking, taking the uh, kick at the start and uh, putting it behind your units. Um, and if you've got a little hero just hanging around the back as well, he's okay to just... You know, just just be within twelve as well. So you get, you know, you get D three uh, D three depravity back. Uh, buy one get one free if you if you summon near it as well. But uh, so I just I yeah sorry I generally oh, put it behind. Yeah okay. I was but, just going to clarify. Just I just wanted to clarify that when you say you prick yourself, we're talking about the damned um, the conduit. Um, we're talking about the second rule where basically at the stand at the start of the enemy hero phase you pick one friendly chaos slanish hero within six of the terrain feature make a sacrifice 
basically uh, you roll a dice on a one, nothing happens. On a two plus, uh, you can re-roll hit rolls for the attacks made by the hero, um, but you do take one mortal wound by yes. doing that ability. That's what we're talking about here. If you're like, I can't, I can't find the prick rule, uh, it's that <laughs> rule. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're playing Slaness. So. <laughs> All the rules, all the rules are the prick rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's nice that it's, you know, taking t- sometimes taking that um, one point of um, that mo- one mortal wound actually just tips you over the edge to get you what you want on your summoning list as well. A few times, just needed one extra at the start of the turn, and just yep, I'll just uh, stab myself on the fan, take a mortal wound, and uh, yeah, I've, I've got enough to summon my ten demonets and. Uh, it's very good, and plus re-rolling to hit again Syn- synchronizes in with the uh, fishing for sixes. If you're going in and you want to fish for sixes with your keeper a secret, you just re-roll those hits. The other rule that we didn't talk about with the prick is um, instead of taking the mortal wound, you can sacrifice your artifact of power, and uh, the artifact of power is no longer to be used throughout the game, but. On the two plus, you get the reroll. So if you don't want to take the mortal wound, or if you're worried about you know dropping down a bracket, uh, there's another way. So th- there's you know if you've got a whole bunch of artifacts for a battalion that you just don't quite need, you could take a sacrificial but uh, artifact to throw into the fire and get yourself some rerolls. Yeah. So the item that generally is used is the um, I believe it's the fan, uh, not the fan. Um... The cameo of the Dark Prince, which is in um, not Invaders, in uh, God Seekers, which you uh, will give you. You basically use it once, gives you a command point, and then it's useless. So you might as well just throw it into the uh, fan and try and get reroll hits uh, for the rest of the game. As long as you don't roll that one, uh, you're good to go. Yeah, sweet. And obviously, the 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 power of Slanesh you talked about is basically a rebate. So if you summon within twelve of the terrain feature you get D3 depravity points back. So basically it's a little rebate that you you get for summoning near the terrain piece. Yeah, and just so people aren't confused, because I've met a few people who have sort of had a go at playing Sinesh, but never really got into it. You don't summon from the fan. There's a, there's a big stigma that you can summon out of the fan. Um, yeah, you cannot summon out of the fan. It has to be from a hero. Yes, because when you summon, it has to be within 12 inches of the hero, a hero, but as well also uh, outside of nine inches from an enemy. Absolutely. And the fan doesn't count the summoning point, even though it looks like one. Uh, yes, it's not a summoning point. No. And, and, and nowhere in the Allegiance ability does it say that you could summon from the terrain piece, nor does on the Fane War Scroll, does it mention you can summon from the terrain piece. It's merely just going to give you a rebate. Much like the uh, Flesh Eater Courts, you, you can be next to the terrain feature and uh, not spend a command point. So um, that's how it works as opposed to it's not, a, it's not a summoning point. No, no. Don't get confused with that. Any additional thoughts or comments when it comes to the Fane? Um, like, obviously, you don't want to block yourself in combat, thinking about where you want to position it. You know, do you want to try to summon off it and get your D3 command points? Do you just want to do it first and, you know, do the the damned rule and then just kind of run run forward? Any other thoughts that you've got around the Fane? Yeah, I, I think uh, depending on what your list is, um, you can use it in different ways. I wouldn't worry too much about the D3 uh, back or summoning near it. That's just like a Brucey bonus if it happens. Um, other than that, you're looking because it can be useful as well. Because again, you lower model count. You can block an avenue to an objective for a, an enemy, uh, make it hard for them to get through there or funnel their big units through to you. Which which works for you if you can just get what if they can only get four of their their hard guys in uh, Maltec guard or whatever. Then you can just put one keeper in. You can. Um, Sort of block them off and make it hard for you. So it's one of those. It's one of those things where it can get in your way, but it can also be useful in getting your opponent's way as well. So uh, it's one you've got to think about. It's not as impactful as some people, some terrain, but uh, I think you're right. Uh, the power of Slanesh rule is nice. I probably wouldn't build a strategy around around it. So. Uh, I think you just kind of filter yourself down a particular part of the table that may not be optimized for what you're trying to achieve, which is ultimately depravity, which is ultimately summoning bodies, which is ultimately killing your opponent. Yes. Yep. 
All right, do you want to get into the first list? Yeah, let's go. Yep. Cool. So Luke has given us two lists. The first one is a God Seekers list. So we're not going to go through the artifacts and every little piece uh, of the God Seekers, but I want to put a bit of context around the first list. So when you choose the God Seekers of the host, you get a couple of things. You get plus one charge, uh, plus one to the charge rolls for units in a God Seeker army. So that's pretty sweet. I think it's pretty pretty obvious. Yep. Uh, obviously, it ties again into the summoning. Uh, you summon those ten demonettes. Uh, you got to get on that objective to tag a unit. Uh, you get a an eight plus re-rolling to get on that uh, objective. You know, last turn, second to last turn, scores you those points. You get the Hedonite, uh, so the God Seeker's Hedonite host, which uh, so on page seventy eight. So this is a, is this a battalion? So you get your army must contain zero to two uh, Epicurean revelers. Uh, battalion. Oh, this, this is this is the this is the super battalion. Yeah, it's just um, uh, you, you kind of read past that. It's not it's not really important. All right, so that's a super battalion. If you're playing in like a three thousand point battle, happy days, yeah. but. Um, okay, so it's, it's supercharging that. Yeah. So the other one is the uh, the Manacle Hunters. So at the end of your charge phase, uh, you receive D3 to property points. If any friendly Godseekers host unit made a charge move in that phase, if three or more friendly Godseeker, ho Godseeker host units made a charge uh, in that phase, you receive D6 to property points instead of D3. Okay. Yeah, so this 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 happens. This is the best one out of uh, each of the abilities. Each of the allegiances has a way to gain some, but this is definitely the best one. And you're generally going to be making three charges a turn, uh, and you get your plus one. So uh, you're generally going to be making it. You're going to be making D6 depravity extra. So you get the plus one to the charge roll because of your Godseeker rules, and then you're going to once you do charge, if you do um, three or more, you're going to get D6 depravity points. Or if you just do a charge, you get D three. So um, yeah. that's that's pretty sweet. Absolutely, every little helps. Definitely. Would you would you hold anything back and try to do a second wave of getting more D threes, or would you just not worry and just whatever needs to charge charges? Look, you you, you just got to make that decision in context of the game. Um, this particular list, uh, uh, there's going to be there's going to be a fair few charges early on. With the way I'm thinking of running it, this is a, a reasonably new list. I tried it out the other day, and uh, it worked quite well. <laughs> I had a lot of depravity. This is a big depravity generation uh, machine. This one, basically, this list. So, all right, well, let's yes. talk about it. So, list number one, podcast listeners, in case you can't see. So, it is Allegiance uh, uh, Slanesh. You are the God Seeker host. Um, you have, surprise of the century, a whole bunch of heroes. <laughs> you have a Keeper of Secrets. That is your general. It is the command trait of Thrill Seeker. It has Sinistrous hot Hand. It has Artifact of the Girdle of the Realm Racer. It then has the Parvain of Slanesh Spell. You then have what? not one, not two, not fee, three. You have three blade bringer heralds of exalted chariot herald on exalted chariot <laughs> you have select shalaxi hellbane with the living whip and then you have an exalted hero of chaos so that is one two three four five that's six six heroes you've maxed six, out on heroes six. in your traditional 2000 point list so taking it from the top we've got the keeper of secrets with that general uh thrill seeker the the hand the girdle the parvain of slanesh Talk me through why is this your general? Talk me through your options and what does this bring to the table? Yeah. Uh, so basically, Frill, this is this is um, I'm playing this a little bit different. So in this list, the keeper hangs back with Shalaxi, and the chariots go forward. So and, and a caveat, I forgot to put the. I've got another item on one of the uh, Hellbringer chariots. Exalted chariots has. Uh, the circle of iron, which uh, stops a unit from fleeing, so it holds it in place. Uh, but the keeper has got run and charge, and it's got fly. Now, unfortunately, we lost his um, his items from malign sorcery. He so, lost them uh, right a cloak. Yeah, which was a far superior. So this one actually makes you lose a wound. So the keeper's down to thirteen wounds, but it flies, it runs and charges. And it's got the spell that lets you either heal D3 or uh, D6 wounds to the Keeper. 
Uh, basically, that keeper and Shalaxi go and deal with anything that is nasty. Anything that's anything that's coming around, sniffing around like a uh, you know a maw crusher or uh, a couple of uh, frost lords, thunder thunder tusks, or uh, anything that anything that the opponent's got nasty coming to you. Uh, these guys go off and they deal with that. With the added benefit that the keeper, should you need to, can basically go, uh, you know, twenty. It'll go twenty inches, and then it'll charge two d six plus one. So it can uh, fly over the top of whatever and get into those little squishy heroes if you need to. If the opponent makes a mistake, I just reread the rules of the Parvain of Slanish spell, and I was like, holy wow! So you you cast it on a seven. If successfully cast, pick one enemy hero within six inches of the caster. And roll the dice, uh, roll the amount of dice equal to the hero's movement. For every five plus, they're going to suffer a mortal wound. So, on your average little foot troop, you might get one or two mortal wounds if you're lucky. You go into something like, I don't know, like I'm thinking my, my, um, my dragon, which is like, you know, movement 14, movement 16, you know, a more crusher, some type of big monstrous mount. That's a lot of dice. That could be, you know, three to six mortal wounds uh depending on the the movement characteristic that's nice yeah uh so just as a caveat i haven't put the spells on the yet. so the the other the other three uh so the blade bring the first blade bring has a spell that heals one mortal wound uh one one wound sorry or on a 10 plus it'll heal d3 wounds to a character uh the other that's blade born bringer, that's born that's born of damnation right yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, Shalaxi, Shalaxi has the uh, she has uh, the progeny of damnation, which is heal, uh, heal, heal again, which is D three wounds, but on a ten plus, he'll heal D six wounds. So her and the keeper hanging about, healing each other up. The other keeper's got the sinister hand, which will heal her up as well. All keepers should have the sinister hand, by the way, guys. Uh, uh, never leave home without it. And uh, the other two guys, the the chariot, the chariot that uh, has the uh, item that stops you from running running away, um, has hysterical frenzy, which is a an amazing spell if you can get it off. It's hard to get off, and uh, circumstantially being in the right place at the right time, it is fantastic. If you get it off on a big unit, you cause all kinds of trouble. So it's casting value of seven. You've got to pick something that's wholly within eighteen. Is it because uh, is it hard to get off because of the holy with yes. 18? Well, that, yeah. that's the idea of the item that the opponent cannot flee. So if you tag a unit with the Exalted Chariot, they're going nowhere, a big unit. And then you can, if you get the double turn or whatever, you can uh, cast Hysterical Frenzy and uh, watch them cry if it goes off. So I imagine don't pick, don't cast that on a unit that is maybe strung out because that's going to be clearly hard yeah. to do an 18. But if you're bunched up, you're in ranks, you're kind of like holding an objective, boom, you're going to be holding within 18. Um, for every six, uh, so, sorry, so you pick a, uh, one enemy unit holding within 18 of the caster and roll one dice for each model in that unit. On a roll of a six, it's D3 mortal wounds. That's brutal. That, that oh, could be brutal. It is absolutely brutal. When it goes off perfectly, it is. It's fantastic, yeah. It, and again, uh, it's, a, it's a spell, so you're gonna you're gonna generate depravity as well. Yes. So it's not just co it's not just combat. It is gonna be spells cast by the slanish heroes. Yes, it's very nice. It's very nice. And uh, the last chariot. Uh, so the other chariot has just got uh, the heal spell, and uh, the other one just uh, the other spells. Yeah, you're starting to get into the realm where they're not so useful. The other one that's okay is soul slice shards, which I take. Um, I generally take on uh, the third wizard or fourth wizard. Basically, it's a banshee screen. So, if anybody doesn't know that, that's two d six. Roll over the leadership and uh, subtract that many mortal wounds. Talk to me about the the bane uh, the blade bringer because I'm used to things having like the the contorted epitome. I'm used to um, the infernal raptress, but I'm, I'm seeing three blade bringer heralds on exalted chariots. Why so, why are you taking three lawnmowers? All right, okay. So this whole list is lawnmowers, but um, the idea is that I've had, and I, I had this is, I had my first game the other day, was how can I maximize depravity? Okay, these guys have got 10 
they've, well, they've got nine wounds each. The Keeper's got uh, 13 wounds. Shalaxi's got 14 wounds. So that's, you know, nearly 50 depravity just in my own stuff. And uh, with a whole lot of damage potential as well. And then I've got this little, little terrible exalted hero of chaos who hides at the back. And if things go sour, I've got 50 depravity to do whatever I want with. Plus mm -hmm. whatever I manage to kill of their heroes. I can... Uh, I'm expecting the the game I had the other day. I think I had about 140 depravity through the whole game over the uh, the whole game, so it worked out quite nicely. So it's worth probably mentioning as well when you spend your depravity, it happens at the end of the movement phase by having that little exalted hero of chaos at the back. That's awesome because you get you're probably going to be away from enemies if you're hiding at the back which just means you can start summoning heroes you can start summoning bodies from that model because shalaxi the keeper of secrets the the blade bringer is all likely going to be in combat or within nine inches of an, an, an enemy so it could be quite hard to bring on bodies with those combat peeps yeah absolutely it's uh and nobody wants to waste their resources on killing the little a little exalted hero could at the back of the board when you've got a couple of keepers and four, uh, three lawnmowers coming at you. So, uh, yeah, he's there as backup. Um, and uh, if things go astray, then you've got a bit of a get out of jail free card at the back of the board. The Bladebringer has a really good movement of 10. Um, I probably should clarify, unless I've missed something here, the Bladebringer has 10 wounds, not oh, 9 ten, wounds. Yeah, it is 10 yeah. wounds. I'm looking yeah, at. yeah, 10 right. wounds. Yeah, exactly. How dare you not remember all? Oh, I know, God. How dare you? <laughs> oh, it's save. It's, it, it, you know, it does some mortal wounds on the charge. It has a spell. Um, it's a hero. It's going to generate you depravity points. Um, a lot of attacks, you know, the piercing claws has nine attacks in there. The poison tongues, eight attacks. There's a lot of attacks in that, in that particular model. So yeah, it, I, I was actually surprised by how many attacks it actually has. Um, because if you tag two units, uh, its ability with its uh, the lawnmower blades is it gets uh, one extra attack for each uh, mortal wound that it's done to um, each unit. So all of a sudden you've got um, you've got n not nine attacks, you've got eleven attacks if you've tagged two units, and then you've got uh, with the uh, eight attacks, and then the steeds have got ten attacks. So you've got you know. It, or the, the they're okay attacks, and you and again, this is where the sixes come in as well. You, you you can explode up, you can get a hell of a lot of attacks out with these guys, and on top of their mortal wound output as well, um, they're quite nasty. They are quite nasty. The, and the base signature spell on the war scroll as well. You cast it on a five, pick a unit within eighteen. You can re-roll hit rolls of one, um, which is pretty sweet as well. So uh, yeah. it saves you spending a command point. Uh, or you're just going to do more damage from that sheer volume of attacks that come from the blade bringer. Yep, yep. It's uh, it's uh, it can be quite nasty, and you know it, it's got four plus saves. Okay, it's okay, and uh, yeah, that's just nine depravity just waiting to go. You can just throw three of those into uh, the whatever you want. Let them let them go crazy, and uh, when they get when they get when they die, that's another you know heap of depravity. I've played two of these, never three. Um, before I move to Shalaxi, I'd love to, like, why Why would you take three of those as opposed to, hey, or maybe just going one and getting another Keeper of Secrets? You know, that'd be a very similar points um, allocation. What's the logic behind taking three of the Heralds, of, Heralds on Exalted Chariot? Well, uh, with the points increases, uh, you can't get a third one. I tried, and uh, yes, you can't get a third keeper. Uh, but no, but I mean, like, if, if you drop two of those blade bringers, that's four forty points. Ah, uh, yeah, that yeah. that would get you a that would get you a second keeper. What is what I'm saying? The 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 problem with the keepers is they are so swingy, and um, they just die so easily without. Uh, yeah, it's just too easy to concentrate on concentrate firepower these days i suppose by your enemies and um I, I just and they degrade as well they degrade badly that's why i'm thinking the, the blade bringers might be the way to go although i have ptsd from building three of them and three chariots which is not being fun they are horrible you will prick yourself it's, 
Uh, you will you will get the the mortal wound uh, to yourself because of the sheer amount of spikes on uh, that. Yes, it's not fun. It's not fun at all. Uh, I would but... I would rather handle a real uh, rose bush many times over before building another one of these. Oh look, uh, I never want to see one again. To be honest, <laughs> it's it's pretty terrible. Yeah, uh, I'm not selling them on the build front, but on the on the battlefield, they are handy. They are yeah. very handy, and they could if they, if you get if you, if you look out, you can you know you do seven or eight mortal wounds with one, and uh, yeah, you got three of them. That's a hell of a lot of mortal wounds. No, that's great. No, 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 I just wanted to ask the question because some people might be sitting there going, well, why would I just run another keeper? And I think it was good. And by the way, folks, this is just showing off a couple of different builds. If you have three Keeper of Secret models and you love running Keeper of Secrets, then we're not telling you not to run them. This is just an example. You do you, but it's great to hear some logic and some thinking around different types of builds, especially with some of the points and rule changes that have recently yeah. happened to Slanesh. Yeah, uh, look, uh, I ran, I basically ran Archeon and two keepers for uh, in Pretenders, and it was devastating. It was a brilliant list, but the points changes up the list by almost over. I think it was about 120 points, which just made that list unrunnable anymore. And uh, it's time to look at a different solution. And I think uh, the sheer amount of depravity I get from this list is uh, potentially, potentially uh, gonna gonna come good. Yeah, the Heralds of Exalted Chariots have been something that has been a little bit of a, a, a sleeper unit. Um, some people have run one of them. I don't think we've seen enough of them. So I well, like Nobody this. wants to build them. <laughs> nobody wants nobody to build, build it, 100%. Problem. Yeah. Shalaxi, yeah, you've, got, you, you've got our named Keeper of Secrets. You've got Shalaxi yeah. Hellbane. Same kind of thing. What does Shalaxi bring to the table? Again, why would I just not take another Keeper of Secrets instead of taking, you know, the named hero? Um yeah, look, this this is a bit a bit of salt for me uh, personally, because uh, I was convinced before the GHB that Chalaxi was going to go down in price. Uh, so I went and bought her and built her, and um, yeah, she went up in price. So uh, I was a little bit salty about that. So I've been trying to run her, and um, yeah, she's got to, she's got to run with another keeper. If she runs with another keeper, she's fantastic, and she she for me performs a mini Archeon sort of build. She's scary. If if somebody brings a big hero over, a keeper can fluff. A regular keeper can fluff easily, um, especially with only two attacks on the big claws. If you fail the locust, you're in trouble. She's got a survivability. She's got a lovely little ability to draw in the. Uh, enemy a hero her spell on a four plus she gets to re-roll her hits and uh, her armor saves her armor save goes up to a three plus against enemy heroes uh, she's got a nice six plus ward save as well and um yeah the soul piercer um is ren three hits on twos wounds on twos before degrading and uh does against enemy heroes six damage so you got potential of um you know, 16 damage. And that's if you don't roll any sixes to hit as well. So she's nasty and deters enemy heroes for definite. Why Why the living whip? Because you do get a weapon choice. You've got um, you've got two different weapon options for Shalaxi. What does the living whip bring to the table? Uh, it makes the enemy hero, I think you pick their monster, and it makes a minus one to hit. Pick one of the profiles. <laughs> If this model is armed with a living whip, at the start of the combat phase, you pick one enemy monster model within six inches of the model and roll of a dice. On a roll a dice. On a three pass, pick a one melee weapon that the enemy monster model is armed with. Subtract one from the hit rolls by made by that melee weapon till the end of that combat phase. Well, it can be clutch, and uh, by no means I'm saying this is better than the uh, the shield. Um. So uh, yeah, that's something I'm still experimenting with because, I, to be honest, I've only I've only run her in uh, three, four, three or four games now, and she's she's going all right. She's actually going quite well. So uh, I've tried a couple of games with the shield and a couple of games with the whip, and um, if I was to be honest now, I'd probably lean more towards the shield. But uh, the whip has it's gone all right in one game in particular. It was pretty good.
And there's a lot of monsters going around right now. I really like the irresistible challenge rule. That's something that reminds me. I'm playing a little bit of Warhammer Fantasy Battles right now. Yeah, and yes. uh, this reminds me of Warhammer Fantasy yeah. Battles, where if a hero is in a unit and challenges, and there's another hero in the opposing unit, you can declare a challenge. And this irresistible challenge is something similar. You, at the start of the enemy charge phase, you pick one enemy hero within 12 of this model and more than three inches from the from any models in your army. Uh, you ask your opponent uh, if that hero is going to accept Shalaxia's challenge. If they refuse, that hero takes D3 mortal wounds. If they accept, the hero must attempt to charge and must finish the charge move within half an inch of the uh, of that model, if possible, to do so. In addition, if the challenge is accepted, any attacks that hero makes uh, must target this model. So if that hero comes into Shalaxi, they've got to fight Shalaxi. They, they can't split their attacks and go somewhere else. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. Uh, no one has accepted yet. So there's been a few D3 mortal wounds handed out. So, uh, yes, no one's no one's took her on yet. But uh, that, that'd, that'd be cool to, like, take off, like, little w wizards in the back or, yeah. you know, these little, like, support heroes, like that hag queen that's sitting at the back or the war chanter that's sitting on the back. Yeah, no, it's nice for little damage like that. And um, if you do manage to get one of the endless spells in your list as well, the mirror is fantastic for that as well. And just little combos like that can really pick those little heroes off. I don't really want to be anywhere near her or uh, any Keeper of Secrets. You've also got the Exalted Hero on uh, of Chaos. Now, you've mentioned that it's a small wound hero that sits at the back. It's great to summon uh, units using your depravity points. Is that the only rule that the Exalted Hero of Chaos brings? Essentially, yeah, he doesn't. He's he's not. He's not. Uh, if anybody's ever read his war scroll, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty poor. Um, that's his job in this list, and now that that may or may not change from this list. Um, may put in an endless spell instead, and uh, we'll see how that goes. But for the moment, he's just a nice little guy to stay at the back, so you can throw those chariots forward. You can throw your, your keepers forward and see what happens. If you if you really want to go for it, if you want to go for the double turn, because this is a low drop army as well. Um, if you can get in and get that double turn with this this army, you're uh, laughing. But things if you lose that if you lose that you lose a few things. You've got your guy there, and he's ready to summon back on another keeper or um, whatever you need. Because if if everything dies in this list except for that guy, you've got fifty something depravity even if you haven't touched your enemy. So you've got, you know, you've got a keeper, you've got 10 demon you, you you're still in the game. Yeah. Yeah, and, and make no mistake, having 50 depravity points can, can again, swing the game quite significantly when you bring that, that keeper of secrets, you know, you could bring almost 40 uh, demonets on the table. So um, having that 90-point investment in the back, I think, is great. I think with the amount of shooting that's coming back into the meta, you certainly want to be protecting and keeping that line of sight blockage as much as possible in order to keep that hero. Uh, a smart hero, a smart, a smart opponent will try to take out that hero, uh, knowing what the plan is. But I think for most cases, um, it's a good investment. If you've got a couple of points up your sleeve, maybe you change that hero to a different small foot troop hero. But uh, I, I do like the strategy behind that. Yeah, that's the idea. I mean, uh, if I could fit the mask in there, that would be great. Nice little hero, but uh, that's what I've got to play with so far. And uh, yeah, it's gone. It's gone okay. The other options you've got is you've got three units of one seeker chariots, and then you've wrapped this all up in a nice little bow with the battalion supreme saberites. Why three chariots? What does supreme saberites bring to the table? This comes in a total of uh, two thousand points, by the way. So it's two thousand points on the nose, and it comes in at eighty-one wounds. So that is quite low for an average Age of Sigmar army. So again, we talked a little bit about uh, having less models, being overwhelmed by opponents. My Gits has like 160, 180 wounds. You know, my, my Cities of Sigmar is probably sitting around 140, 150. So almost half the wounds in this army you need to be smart with your choices. So why three units of one Seeker Chariots and then why Supreme Saberites? Uh, so the Seekers... Uh, I'm trying them out with the theme. Um, they are battle line. They are only battle line in this. Uh, in this. Um, God seekers. God seekers. Yeah. 
And uh, I've toyed with the idea of having units of three. The prob- problem is the bases are quite large with chariots. So game round terrain is, uh, you know, tricky at some times. But uh, they've got a nice little mortal wound. If you're going with a couple of them together, you get a, you get on average four mortal wounds. And you, you're going to kill screens. You're going to kill uh, smaller units. They've got a bit of toughness. Uh, you know, they're uh, armor save four. They're fast. They go 12. They charge with the plus one as well. They can get where you need them to be. And... Um, in, even in combination with this, you can you can pair them off with an exalted chariot each, just to give you that extra mortal wound buff. You you be, be av- you could average uh, you'd be averaging six seven mortal wounds when you go in, plus all your attacks with them going together, which is nice. And uh, yeah, they're just they're just nice and mobile. Not a bad. I, I, I was gonna I was gonna ask you a three seeker chariot and three uh, exalted. Sorry, the heralds on exalted chariots. Do they work as power pairs? Yeah, they're um, little buddies. Little buddies that come in on the side and just add that extra couple of mortal wounds. So, you know, you're averaging four or five mortal wounds with the uh, with the Exalted on an average roll, and then you're averaging an extra two. So that, you know, seven mortal wounds straight off the bat before you even start fighting. You might make them fight last as well. There's a keeper around. You can make the Exalted double pile in. Uh, yeah, they can be nasty little pairs, yeah. I think for me, the one rule, I don't think we talked about it yet. The one rule that I absolutely love on the Seeker Chariots is the Impossibly Swift, which is allows you to retreat yes. and charge in the same turn. So if you if you went in with the, ex- the Exalted Chariot and the Seeker Chariot, um, you know, and you get the double turn on your next turn, you, your opponent's not able to kill the, the Seeker Chariot, you'd be able to retreat and kind of either you know leap a screen or get around a screen again movement 12 it's a very nice movement and get into a squishy hero to kind of get into the backfield to challenge an objective um there's some some nice things you can do with the retreat and charge that is uh, a, a pretty under um underappreciated rule so yeah. by you having it that's sexy yeah it's very fun. it's very good rule and you think you're going over the board you're going 12 and you're charging with the plus one you get the double turn. You re- you can retreat, yeah, and you're you're at the other side of the board. You're at the other side of the board. You where the yeah. enemy doesn't want you to be, and you're going you're going fast, and you're uh, you you can be dangerous. You know, little heroes, they're in trouble. I'm so f- I'm, I mean, I'm so focused on taking out uh, the keepers of secrets, Shalaxi. I'm so exactly. t- I'm so focused on killing the heroes that I'm probably not going to be thinking about the retreating and charging uh seeker chariots and hell if i'm in combat with the herald on exalted chariot and a seeker chariot i'm probably going to put my attacks in the hero chariot not the battle line chariot and then that's where you punish me for not focusing or tying that up yeah yeah it's uh yeah it's a people get uh people get scared of those keepers and their uh their eyes just drift on that meanwhile the little chariots are going around uh, mowing things over it's uh yeah definitely good and then supreme samurite kind of wraps it all up so the supreme samurites is three to six chaos slanish heroes so basically that's all of your heroes and that's why you probably see it almost in every slanish because there's no reason why you wouldn't at the start of your hero phase, roll the dice on a if the roll is less than or equal to the amount of heroes from this battalion that are on the battlefield, you receive one command point. Yep, necessary in this. Definitely, uh, you need command points. Slaneshi's command point, greedy, very greedy, and um, you, you must, it's a must take, especially giving you a four drop. You uh, you generally want your opponent to go first, depending on the list, but or, or the deployment, whether you're 18 away or 24, you want your opponent to come to you in most cases. So uh, and you want to play for that double turn. If you get that double turn, then you're uh, yeah, it's it's long mower time. And this is where the other God Seeker host artifact of the cameo with the Dark Prince getting an extra command point. Um, again kind of stacks up and gets those extra command points where are you spending them so you, you mentioned that you're hungry for command points where are you spending them well the keeper the keeper has an ability that lets uh pick any uh slash holder within 12 unit holder within 12 you get to fight again pile in and fight again so that you can make those chariots go again you can make shalaxi go again you make the keeper itself go again i mean that's three gone in one combat round 
So, so, so you uh, so you want to keep those command points up your sleeve, not spend them on re-rolling charges unless you have to, right? Like if I've got a keeper of secrets that failed my charge, I'm going to want yeah. to spend that because even though it might reduce you one dub one less double pile in by not being in combat, um, I'm going to be probably shot at. I'm going to be like, I'm, I'm in for a bad time potentially. Yeah, failing charges just on Ash is uh, it's not nice because you really need those command points for the double pile and definitely it's uh, if you roll those double ones for going in, it's a it's a bad time definitely. Yes. So first priority for command points is going to be the charging. Uh, if you fail the charge, the second priority is going for that double pile in. So the more command points you've got to double pile in, uh, the more chaos and depravity you're going to be generating on the table. Yep. So you, and the locus comes into it as well in what you're selecting what to do. So if you get the locus off, then you've got a bit of a free reign. Um, but yeah, you want to you want to select first where you don't get your locus off, and then uh, go in without go with whatever, whatever units there, and then uh, hopefully they don't do enough to hurt your keeper. Go again. That's uh, that's what you want to prioritize. Any other comments that you would make on this God Seeker list? Uh, yeah, it's been fun. I've only had the one game with it so far. I played Seraphon and uh, I won that game. Well, it was my opponent's first uh, game with his Seraphon. And um, yeah, I've got to say, those uh, Bastilodons, three damage to demons, uh, not good. Not good. No, there's actually not a lot of de There's not a lot of those builds out there. They've all gone down the Salamander <laughs> build. But yeah, uh, I. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I don't feel bad for Seraphon at all. I'm actually cheering Slanesh here. I never yeah. thought I'd never thought I'd see the day where I'm cheering. Like, yeah, that's not cool. Um. <laughs> no, it was horrible. Well, he basically made the mistake. He made the mistake. He shot one keeper and did twelve wounds to it with one Bastilodon, and then he was like, "Nah, I'll just shoot your chariot." Fluffed it, and the keeper healed up six wounds from the. Uh, from the healing spells, and then he got to double pile in with Shalaxi, and uh, yeah, it was GG from there. Yeah, I don't, I don't so, feel sorry for him. But that was your oh, first it's horrible. List. It's horrible. Uh, That's horrible. No, I don't Who made that rule? <laughs> Still a done rule. One plus armor save. No, no sympathy for them. The next list you've got for me is the Invaders host. So very similar to the last list. Uh, we'll we'll go over some of the rules first to kind of put into context uh, why we've taken the list that we've taken. So. Invaders host, if uh, an, an invaders host army can have up to three generals instead of one. It's a very interesting mechanic. Only one of the generals, your choice, can have a command trait, but all three are considered to be the general for the purposes of using command abilities. However, in an invaders host general, so however, an invaders host general cannot use a command trait or command ability while they are within 12 inches of another friendly invaders host general. In addition, each time one of your generals is slain for the first time, you receive one extra command point. All right, there's a lot to unpack there. So first stuff, I get three generals instead of one. Why is that important? Um, just a caveat, this is the uh, lurid haze in uh, invaders, which is a little bit different oh. as well. Where's that coming from? Have I got the wrong rules up? So that that is from the Wrath of the Ever Chosen. Oh, hashtag fail. I thought I was being really smart. <laughs> I, I just really made a toast. All right, ignore that. I'm going to go straight to the well, list. Well, it there. still counts. It's still part right. of it. It's still right. part right. of it. So, yeah, the three generals, I mean, it, sound, it sounds better than it actually is. Again, you're generally fighting with heroes. And uh, although in this list, not too bad because uh, there's a – there's a couple of solid uh, melee units that are pretty useful for uh, passing battle shock within twelve and whatnot. So uh, yeah, it's not too bad. It's not too bad, but it's 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 not as important as it seems. All right. Well, what what else do you get? Because okay, see so the list that you have taken is not Invaders Host. You have taken one from the Wrath of the Ever Chosen book, which is the Lured Haze Invaders Host. So it's a little yes. bit different. Yes. So tell yes, me more. Tell me more. What, what, do I, what do I get for being a <laughs> Lurid Haze? So the Lurid Haze. Now, this is where I've come up with this, this list to sort of counter the current meta with Slanesh. Uh, and it comes down to this main two main abilities. Uh, the main ability is after you complete 
after you complete setup, but uh, before the first battle round, you can roll a d a d three. You take that many units off the board and reset them up again within six of the uh, as an ambush. So nine away from your enemy, six on the board edge. So this lets you basically have a free teleport. The turn one, take d three units off the board. D three teleport. Yes. Okay. Wow. Yeah, and when nasty. we start looking at, and, and, and to ruin Christmas for anyone on the podcast, because the, the YouTubers can see this, in this list you have Bellacor, you've got Archeon, you have Chaos Lord, the Chaos Sorcerer Lord, you have a Keeper of Secrets. So you haven't got the six, you've gone four. Um, and I wonder which D3 you would be taking off the board. Well, if you scroll down, there's uh, the best charging uh, unit in the game. In the uh, in the uh, lower units there. All right, Luke, Luke spoiled Christmas. So we've also got <laughs> twenty cast marauders, twenty cast marauders, five hell striders with with uh, claw spears. No battalion coming in at nineteen sixty. A little bit more wounds with ninety seven wounds. So uh, before we go into actual unit selection, is there any other rules that you get other yep. than the D three um, units that can be put into reserve? Is it reserve yeah, so or the, is it reserve or teleport? Oh, it's a reserve. It's reserve. Okay. So they come in. They come in. They come in on the edge on your first turn, essentially. But it's only the first turn. Ah, uh, has to be first turn. So you yeah, can't keep them in reserve turn, for a couple yeah, of rounds. So okay, it has so. to be first turn. Um, which because it's a seven drop can make your uh, opponent think twice about giving you the first turn as well. Uh, but the other fantastic rule about this uh, battalion is the command ability that any uh, hero can use. And that is, you can give yourself in combat plus one armor save. So, the big fella is now rocking a two plus armor save. The Chaos Sorcerer Lord, uh, his ability, holy within 12, pick a, uh, pick a Slaves to Darkness unit, which is Arch. He uh, can now reroll all his armor saves. So, he's now got a two plus armor save in combat. It's actually not armor saves as well. He actually gets to re-roll his ward save as well. It says re-roll all saves. Oh. So now so now Archeon has a two plus save in combat, re-rolling his saves and re-rolling mortal wound saves on a four plus as well. You are a mean person. It's nasty. It's absolutely horrendous. And uh the the Basically, the tax of the battalion is the keeper has to take the command trait. We let you reroll run rolls of units holy than twelve, and it gets plus one room wounds. So the keeper goes up to fifteen wounds. Uh, That's feverish anticipation. Yes, feverish anticipation and oil of exaltation gives plus one wound to the keeper. Plus one to its wound rolls. Yes. Okay. So it's got fifteen wounds, and uh, the keeper again is Archeon's buddy. Uh, so also the Chaos Sorcerer Lord has a spell that lets uh, you reroll all hits and wounds. I was get just, it off. I was just looking that up. So that's the this, the progeny of Damnation. So if you get everything going your way, Archeon will have exploding sixes because he's in Slanesh. He will reroll all hits and wounds. He will have a two plus armor save rerolling, and he will also have a four plus ward rerolling. So uh, and with Slanesh, he will, with the Keeper of Secrets, he will double pile in. And uh, if you get off his ability on himself as well, if he dies, he'll pile in again. So three times piling in Archeon, potentially re-rolling everything is going to ruin anybody's day. And we were worried about Grizzle Gore double piling in Terror Geist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he laughs at Terror Geist, this fella. Gosh. All right. So that, that, that's the role of the Keeper of Secrets. Let's go up to Bellacor first. So Bellacor is an ally. So why why did we bring in Bellacor, uh, especially as an ally? And do you so lose any by being an ally? He, do, he does not. He is not Slanesh. So he does not explode on sixes. You cannot summon from him. Um, he has. He has. He has his rule. And this is uh, basically save your bacon if things go astray, or if you do face uh, a shooting army. Um, shout out to you, Kron. And uh, 
He, uh, <laughs> this is you can turn we, a terrain we basically, yeah, basically we, we, make a terrain piece block line of sight. No, no, he, he makes something, Bellacore makes something, not be able to uh, shoot, fire, charge. And, That's right. Uh, on a do five? On a five plus, they yes. must roll. Yeah, they must roll a five plus if they do absolutely anything. Move. Um, so this covers you. So at the start of the game, you get to take off D3 units. If your opponent uh, wants to let you do that, you can uh, you can take the Archeon off. You can take wh whatever you manage to roll. You send the Marauders in. And then on their turn, you can activate Bellacore because he's, whatever wh it really, really challenges your opponent. If they deploy badly, if they deploy badly, and then you Bellacore the, their counter unit, then that's it. They can't get in. They can't fight. And they've just lost an entire flank. And if they double turn, you're no big deal. You've just lost 40 Marauders. Now you've got a chance at a double turn with, say, Archeon or anything else. You've got uh, the Keeper running up the table. So it's a real catch-22, and it can get in people's heads. And plus, obviously, even if you lose 20 Marauders, you can always summon back 20, um, 20 yeah, Demon. Yeah, who cares? You, you, you probably have the depravity to generate a whole bunch of um, bodies. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, don't get the Marauders wrong. They, they kick out – 20 Marauders kick out – some serious damage they're not a jerk uh, they're, they're, why why have you got them because they do kick you've taken them not because of their damage dealing potential you've taken them for the movement shenanigans which yes uh, i don't think a lot of people ha they've heard about it but they probably haven't really thought about it or experienced yeah. it. And, it, and it's it's silly it is silly it but is it's a, it's a rule so talk me through the marauders so when the Marauders charge, they get plus one to charge inertly from their drummer. And when they charge, they get to ch change the lowest dice to a six automatically. So you can only fail on a double one if you set up without, within nine. I first saw this with the Slaves to Darkness. They've got a teleport spell in their list that lets you teleport. Generally, someone will teleport four Marauders, and then they'll, they'll go in with the Marauders and it'll de devastate something. Maybe they'll have the Chaos War Shrine on, I'm not sure. But... It just caught my eye with this, the lurid haze, and I thought, well, take D3 units off. I mean, making nine-inch charges is sketchy at the best of times. But the Marauders, on the other hand, that's a guaranteed charge pretty much every time you do it. And you're getting into what you need to get into. You're causing havoc at the start of the game. And uh, it just forces your opponent to set up differently. Maybe even take the first turn himself. Yeah, pinning coming on the side of the board and pinning your opponent. And I, I played um back back in the day, a few years ago, I played with um Legions of Night, which is a sub allegiance of the Legions yeah. of Nagash. And one of the benefits of Manfred's Legion of Night was you could take D three you could take three units and have them in reserve for I think it was four rounds. So it plays in a very similar, similar way. But the challenge I always had was that um, you had to deploy them on any side of the board so long as it was within six inches of the board edge and yeah. and, and you had to be have nine inches away bet between you and your opponent. So yeah. it forced you to get any – because a, a nine-inch charge is like a 75% chance of failure, Yeah, um, which is huge, right? Like people underestimate how hard it is to do a nine-inch charge. Easy. It's I not easy. Nine, I, yeah, I mean I played Night Haunt before this and it was all about the nine-inch charges, so – I know how hard it is. It's not. It's not easy. It doesn't happen often. It's really hard. So, so for me to get that in my legions of night, I had to either get chronomatic cogs, get plus two, the, two to the charge. I needed yep. my uh, my Morgast, the Harbringers that have a D three D say three three D six charge. There was very few ways that I could get consistency in a terror geist or a zombie unit or a skeleton unit or a var geist unit to get a nine inch charge. But by you being able to do that through the Marauders and, and basically guarantee the charge is hugely beneficial. It means you pin your opponent and they can't go and score the objectives. Or you're able to completely control one part of the board while the rest of your army, and, you know, like let's say Archeon. Archeon's about to rain terror on part of the board. The thing that's going to kind of go hunt Archeon, you could pin them with literally what, a less than 200 point unit is pinning Archeon with a guaranteed move. That's crazy good. Yeah, it's uh, – and not only that, it lets me 
I played at City's of Sigma Army on the third game and uh, he set up in the most defensive formation right at the back of the board and the Marauders came on the side straight into the handgunners, straight into the archers, just, yeah, just devastated him straight away. Shooting list, this is the way around the shooting list. And, uh, yeah, it just gives you so much versatility. And even if you just want to tag them, tag their, their line at the start, it just throws their entire turn out and uh, puts them on the back foot straight away. Yeah, that's neat. That's really neat. Um so we know where Bellacore's there. Bellacore's there is um, that that ability to make a unit have to do anything. There's a restriction on like what it, what it can and can't do, but basically it has to roll a five plus in order to do its thing. And you roll that every phase. So if it you know you might fail the move, but you know it might come to combat and you you know you you keep rolling those five pluses. We've got the big bad. We've got Archeon the Ever Chosen. Eight hundred points. That is just under one half of your army going in what is Archeon bringing so I, we, we've we've heard about the the, the two up after the, the, two, the two plus armor save with the four plus ar uh, so four up so two plus armor save four plus after save with the re-roll um what else is Archeon bringing to the table so he's just clutch and uh there's moments in a game when you're playing a good player and uh for instance in the last game Rat trap comes down, traps everything. I cannot move anything if that rat trap's there. It's a hard thing to dispel naturally. You talk about the the the, uh, the the vortex, the, um, the vortex, yeah, the vortex. Uh, the uh, scave, the scaven, scaven. the scaven the warp, vo yeah, the warp lightning vortex. Yeah, yeah, the the, the most horrible end of the spell in the game. It's disgusting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just that ability to just go. No, sorry, that's gone. Take it away, take it away. Ignoring the magic on a four plus, fantastic. Someone's got to, someone's got to do something clutch. No, nope, not today. Sorry. And uh, obviously, I don't need to go on about his destructive potential. If he's re-rolling everything, getting exploding sixes and a two plus save, he's he's an absolute tank. And uh, question for you: Are you using his command ability that allows him to yes. to know to know who takes priority? Oh no, that is only in Slaves to Darkness. Does not work in Slash. Uh, there's any one. It does not work. Well, I wish it did, but it doesn't. Um, no. Uh, I, I was it thinking that was just. A, I was thinking that was just a war scroll. Uh, no, ability. no. What's beautiful about him though is he counts as a Slash hero, so he generates depravity. So he's got twenty wounds. So that's nineteen depravity. That's nineteen depravity in the bank already, and uh, he dishes it out. He kills anything just about in the game. He's a depravity machine, so he's he's there butchering away, and he's got his he's got his own ability. You should just you just put it on him just in case, you know, if somebody comes in and kills him, and he gets to fight again. That's more depravity, more in the bank. The keeper makes him fight pile in and fight twice. Yeah, he's just a monster. He's an absolute yeah, he's, monster. It, it, it will take you know it might cost you eight hundred points, but in most armies, it's probably very few. Um, most armies will spend more than eight hundred points trying to handle Archeon. And it will ruin people's strategies. So it is the, I, the, the definition of a uh, distraction can't affect. Just something that you put on the table and most opponents will have to deal with it in some way. You can't just ignore Archeon because it's just going to do damage. It's just going to ruin yeah. your day. The thing, the thing that really – because I've run him a few times before and he does die. He dies. But – the Chaos Sorcerer Lord, the ability, re-rolling your saves with the two plus save, he's not dying. He just didn't die. I don't think he died in a single game, played in the last five game tournament. What are you most scared of with Archeon? Like what what is gonna kill Archeon? Um what, what is it what, what do you have to watch out for or what is more likely to kill Archeon than not kill Archeon? Um Nagash. Nagash has taken him out a couple of times. Um Look, mass and mass attack uh, from a very good unit uh, will take him out. Fire Slayer is a massive unit of Hearthguard. Obviously, they're Metal super Sword. durable as well, right? So yeah, they're going to come yeah. in, do a whole bunch of mortal wounds, and they're just as durable. So Fire Slayers, your Hearthguard Berserkers and things. Yep, they'll sort him out. Um, 
What about your KO? Would KO with their long range shooting with high well, range damage? Yeah. yeah, the last game of the tournament I played. Um, Ken Cron. The, the, Ken, Ken, yeah, uh, the old the old Cron. He threw everything into him, and uh, this is where Bellacar came in handy. He had uh, twenty Thunderers ready to just blow him off the table. We've played quite a few times, me and Cron, and he's blown him off the table every time. But Bellacar came in clutch. Couldn't fire the Thunderers, and he left Archeon on one wound. <sighs> yep, and uh, priority goes my way, and he gets to come in and smack that boat up. So, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, KO is something to be scared. Look, I think everyone's going to be scared of shooting in the recent months to come once we get uh, up and running again with tournament yeah. season. The I Lumineth. imagine things like maybe Salamanders, your Lumineth, uh, maybe your Phoenix Guard, again, they're pretty durable. Probably not as combaty. They're not as combaty as your Hearthcar Berserkers, but they are quite durable. And even bogging down Archeon, you know, with a unit of Phoenix Guard, yeah, is just rubbish. as valuable. Yeah, it is just as valuable. Just tying it up with a, a cheap, you know, sixty grots, you know, forty skeletons, um, and keeping him away from other things. If you really want to stop him, use the terrain to your advantage because that pie plate. He's not. <laughs> he's not good for getting him around. If you've got, if there's lots of bodies everywhere, you just can't get in anywhere. You can't mm. move. It's hard to get in places. Yet, yeah, uh, utilize the the size of his base. It's difficult. It's difficult for him to get places. Yeah. It. it, it, it yeah. It, it is hard. Like you look at Alario, you look at Archeon with such big bases, you've got to really think about even getting a three inch, uh, getting your pile in right. It can be very difficult with terrain, with, you know, screens. So um, think about how, and I guess I'm high that highlighting this because if you are going to, you know, invest 800 points, you need to know the, the, the damage dealing potential. You need to know how much damage it can, we can kind of take and how to start thinking about making the most of your significant investment because it's not a throwaway unit 800 points is no. a big investment no it's a big investment and i've looked a lot into a lot of his builds in uh corn and uh slaves to darkness and i just think the fact because he's got a five plus make your fight last as well because he's a slash hero he gets to fight last he gets the exploding sixes he gets to summon from him as well. I just think he runs. This is the, this for me. I cannot think of a better way to run him in any list, in any other faction at all. I think this is my opinion. The best Archeon you can run in the game. Yeah, uh, I would maybe challenge you with a Zench Archeon with the Destiny dice up his sleeve, possibly, but yeah, possibly uh, yeah. potentially. But I think you know, uh, definitely. Definitely stronger than, say, a corn one. Probably even a Nurgle one, I'd say. Definitely Slanish is up there. Um, at minimum, top two, if not top. Yeah, look, I forgot about the, the Destiny dice are cheat, aren't they? So, uh, I mean, yeah. All, yeah, I, I've seen some pretty crazy stuff, and you get the right dice, the Destiny dice roll, and just by guaranteeing things with Archeon, then, you know, yeah, yeah, your opponent yeah. will be a bad time. And fair enough. Fair enough for that call. Fair enough. Um but in terms of uh, what he can do with the summoning, better summoning, exploding yeah. sixes, um, de uh, depravity generation, yeah, he's he's fantastic, absolutely fantastic in this. We talked about the two, two the two units of twenty chaos marauders. The only question I've got for you is any reason why you wouldn't take a a bigger block of forty? So I tried with the forty uh, with a couple of this before, and the problem is again it's. Um, Getting them on the board with the uh, with the uh, six inch away, half the unit cannot get in with that spell, even with a thirteen inch charge or whatever, can't get in, and uh, it's just a bit. You, you just want more spread, you know. If you want to leave one back on an objective, they still do the same amount of damage in a twenty as a forty as well. Okay, you only have to kill one to knock them down from their end. But it's just it's just uh, more manoeuvrable, and with the with the coming on the side of the board edge, that's that, that's that was better. That, it just it just seemed better. Forty forty all clumped together was just no, nah, just didn't seem to work. It it makes sense if if you could hold them off the board for two, three, four rounds when you've got better body control when uh, things are dying. I think you're right. Forty makes sense, but 
because you have to bring it on in the first turn, then, um, yeah, that, that makes sense, having just a small unit to bring them on, being a harasser, do some damage, but not necessarily bog them down and just do absolute terror because that's where the Keeper of Secrets, that's where Archeon come to, come to the table. Yeah, it's really about... Uh... Kind of a, a sort of philosophy we're playing Slanesh was sort of pick a flank and move along it, move down it, or look look for your uh, multiple wound. You know where where you're going to get your depravity from, and you can use that Marauder unit to come on, make them sort of come one way. If they send the wrong unit over, you Bellacore it, and then you head over there with a the keeper and Archeon and just mop up. You've sent them where you want them to go. You make them go where you want them to go. Finally, you've got the five Hell Striders. And by the way, you know, as we mentioned earlier, if you don't have Archeon, you don't want to run Archeon, you know, you could you could apply a very similar strategy with uh, taking those points and putting on two Keepers of Secrets, for example. Um, yeah. there, there's other ways you can build around this. You could put down three or four of those Lawn Mowers, again, for the same price. But I think you're right, collapsing the flank, harassing, having some of that sideboarding shenanigans. Um, this, is, this is great. Age of Sigmar is not a combat game. It is a movement game. Um, Absolutely. So being able to, you know, dictate the terms of battle. Even I remember the when I played Legion of Night, half the victory was a psychological battle for my opponents, worrying where I'm going to come yeah, on the exactly. side of the board. Um, and they would hold back units from moving forward because they wanted to, you know, screen the backs. They would stretch their units out as far as they could to kind of stop uh, me coming on from the side. So the way that they moved their army out was different than if I didn't sideboard. So that in itself can play to the strengths of then Archeon and other things coming down the table because opponents are going to be stretched. It's going to be harder to be yeah. in buff ranges. It's going to be um, easier for you to, to to be outside of inspiring presence, all that type of stuff. Yeah, 100% right. And uh, it is a game about movement. And if you can stretch your opponent into deploying differently than they would, they're worried about the Marauders, um, then if they go after the Marauders, they're going to get countered by, you know, they've got to send something decent to deal with the Marauders. They're not a pushover. And they're, um, only, 100, they're only 160 oh, points. They're, it's disgusting only, how good they are. It's disgusting no, how good. Even <laughs> even they, but even if they put so much focus into the Marauders, you just shrug and go, so what, 160 yeah, points? Who cares? Oh, that, you that, just that, wasted that, that's you what I paid two for. Turns. <laughs> well, that yeah, correct, and that's what I paid for in my last list for Supreme Saberites. That one battalion was the equivalent of, of this unit. So, cool, good for yes. you. Yeah, yeah, good on you. And now I've just and then that's that's what I mean. You low on wounds, you just cap some more objectives that they would have been capping. So uh, there you go. And then finally, you got the five Hell Striders with claw spears. Um, I imagine they're bringing speed. They're bringing. What, they're a harasser? They're an objective scorer? Yeah, I, I, look, because of the points increases, I used to take three units of five with their battalion, which is fantastic. Um, but it, it, it's just pushed them over the edge, sort of, that the Marauders are now a better choice, especially in this list. They're very good at... Uh, the, the, if anyone doesn't know, the battalion lets them pile in six and fight. But you don't fight with them. You just pile them into 2.98 inches and just tag a unit. And just, just to draw things in, you want to be drawing things where you want things to where the keepers are or where Archeon is or where your good stuff is. And, uh, yeah, they're great for that. And they get across the board, 20-inch move on a run, tag an objective for you. They'll do work. They'll, they'll score you some points. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, again, most of your points are going into the heroes, which, uh, again, is no surprise for a Slanish army I like your lists. I think they're pretty cool. Um, I probably should have done my research a little better because I saw Invader Host. And I'm like, cool, I'll bring up my Invader Host rules. But turns out yeah. there's a whole bunch of, and that's probably a really nice call, is that Slanesh is not just Hidden Knights of Slanesh. You have Beasts of Chaos Slanesh. You have Wrath of the Ever Chosen of Slanesh. You have Slaves to Darkness Slanesh. So, so very much like me with my cities of Sigma, where I can I can put in Stormcast and KO and and deep and I, there's so much I can bring in. Slanesh, anything can be marked Slanesh from you know Slaves to Darkness. There is a Beast of Chaos Battalion that marks yep. the the Beast of Chaos as Slanesh. So, yeah, 
the depraved trove. So no matter which way you want to build, there is there is something for you. And I think what I enjoyed about this, Luke, is you showed off two different examples that are different from what we knew in General's Handbook 2019 that people can now start thinking about when tournaments resume, when things kind of go around, how do I handle the meta? We've now heard some really good ideas of, right, I'm, I'm, I'm being harassed by long-range shooting. Well, here's an example of how I can put some stuff on the side of the board and avoid that. Um, I'm being, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having magic is dominating the meta. You know, Techless and, and Croak are doing something. Cool. Here's a different way around it. Or well, this is how I could potentially uh, reach out and maybe do those challenges with Shaleski and um, start chipping away mortal wound damage while I'm kind of coming up the board. Yeah, look, uh, don't get me wrong. The keeper list is still. Um viable it's just not as powerful as it once was i don't think it has been hurt a lot from the the nerfs and uh, a lot of people you know i still like to bring out four keepers now and again just for a good game but i just think there's so much more to it i've even i was even looking the other day varingard i mean they they get all the abilities you can buff them up the same way as you know they'd be scary they'd be pretty scary piling in twice uh as, with the Sunesh exploding sixes they'd be pretty scary in, uh, as well. So there's a whole wealth that you can go through. And I think it's not the end for Sinesh. Uh, a lot of people are a bit salty about it, myself included. But uh, no, there's lists there that uh, can be very competitive in my opinion. All I'll say is you literally have a box set coming very soon, as if Games Workshop is going to release a slanish box set <laughs> and it's going to let you be rubbish. Uh, I guarantee <laughs> I you you're, you will be... Uh, n- you will be middle of the pack for like two months when literally no one's running tournaments. And then as soon as tournaments come back up, oh, look, Slanesh is now amazing. Surprise. <laughs> Your time in the darkness is very short. Yes, 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 I think so. Final question for you before we wrap this up, because this has been really valuable and I appreciate your time, is what have you learned with all of your experience, all of your times playing at the top? You know, you have done some really great performances in the tournament scene. What have you learned over your time that may not be as obvious uh, to a newer player or an inexperienced player by running Slanesh? And I imagine depravity points might be yeah. one that it takes time for you to learn. But what else had you learned with your experience? Okay. I, it comes back to that 28 depravity uh, I mentioned at the start. You're looking for two two units of demonettes towards the ends of the game to cap objectives. Now, this means a lot of a lot of people I've seen play Sinesh, they just run forward. They just run forward and go, 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 go. You don't have to do that. You don't have to play for the double turn. Don't get suckered in. You just need that 30 depravity by turn three or four. Play the mind games. Um you know, pull pull your opponent where you want them to go. Go where you want to go. And uh, d- just don't run off straight away. It's so tempting to go in with your big keepers straight away. But trust me, it doesn't always work. And they whiff. They can whiff. And uh, you'll be facing a bit of a bad time. So, yeah, I would say be patient. Be patient with them. You're looking to win on turn four and five. And that's my that's my experience with Sunesh. You're looking to win the late game. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, protecting your heroes, I think you're right. Going in and trying to smash your opponent, you are a glass cannon. You, you're you not Iron Jaws. You don't take the punch as well as you give the punch. Um, so the minute that uh, – and uh, there's been plenty of times as well where um, that's happened against me, and a lot of my armies I run are one-wound units. So they're running around, and you're not generating a lot of depravity. So – if you have a Keeper of Secrets going into, let's say, the unit of Phoenix Guard or a unit of Grots, uh, you are literally not generating depravity yeah. points. So by holding back and being smart, um, you've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. But if you run into my Grots and you kill 60 Grots, cool. And I do half, I don't yeah, know, yeah. I do a bunch of wounds to you. So what? You generated no depravity. Yeah. Don't run into 60 Grots. <laughs> it's a terrible matchup for a Keeper. Yeah, You'll take it off. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah, like yeah. It, it, just be smart with your decisions. Don't yeah. don't just run in for the sake of running in. Uh, and be be smart where you're running yeah. as well. You'll lose you lose more if you're not thinking about what where you're going. Uh, looking for your depravity. Looking where where can you? Has your opponent made a, a mistake with moving somewhere they shouldn't? 
look at look at screening off as well. Screen. I mentioned the Hell Striders. They're a great screening unit as well for your keepers. Um, even if you just get the three inch attack over the top, make them fight last. Yeah, you've got you've got to be smart. It's a smart army. I'll say that hundred percent. And you know, even with one of your lists where the keeper could fly. Um, Flying over screens and getting into that juicy center is worth the patience as well. So, um, yes, like learn learn your base size and be smart about it as well. That's that can get you into some some really juicy targets where you can do some damage uh, and where you want to do damage. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I'll just say it's a new. If you're a new player, just build. Uh, 20, 30 demonettes, and never, ever take them as core. Never take them as your core. Keep them in the toolbox. You want That's to summon it. them. Put them, in, put them in the back. Put them and, in the boot. And at Sesame Street, we always have a letter and a number. The number of today is 28. <laughs> That's the one. 28. Awesome. Luke, this has been awesome. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I hope people who listen to this have um, a new appreciation or, or a bit more motivated to pick up their Slanesh. I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I didn't think it was doom and gloom, but I think you've shown off a few examples where we can start building in some new lists, some new ideas to get the most out of our book. We do have reinforcements along the way. Who knows? Maybe an updated book's coming. Who knows what this new Herald that's in the box set does? Uh, don't forget, we've got Slaves of Darkness, you've got Wrath of the Ever Chosen, you've got Beasts of Chaos, you've got so much to draw from. The Dark Prince is is not going away. <laughs> deprived as ever. <laughs> He's deprived as ever. If people wanted to talk to you, Luke, and I didn't actually ask you this question beforehand, but if people wanted to talk to you, are you on social media? Can people find you anywhere? Uh, or do they just uh, have to yeah. uh, uh, prick themselves next to the Thane? Th <laughs> Prick yourself next to the friend, definitely. That'll summon me. <laughs> Say my name three times. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm on Twitter. I've got a, I've got a, just a Warhammer, a Warhammer account. It's called uh, How Many Wounds. Uh, and you'll see a little uh, little white rose flag there. And, uh, yeah, that's it, really, on Facebook. Just my name. That's me, if anybody wants to get in touch. And pretty active in the South Australian scene. And uh, I was really getting into the tournament scene until – you know, the apocalypse happened. But, uh, yeah, as soon as it's over, uh, I'll be back into it. That's right. Nurgle can have its time now, but Slanesh yes. is coming back. So we'll – and I'll, and I'll put the, uh, the your Twitter handle in the, the show description when this goes up on YouTube. So people can chat to you more and share ideas. I'm sure people want to talk to you about your lists and maybe share some of their own advice and thoughts around what they're doing. And uh, the Dark Prince can rise again. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Luke, this is awesome. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'm going to end the broadcast by saying, go the Bulldogs. <laughs> go the bunnies. <laughs> See you, mates. G'day. I hope you enjoyed that video and you're left with some new ideas. One of the biggest ways you can contribute to AOS Coach is by liking the video you just watched and leaving a comment in the comment section. This lets YouTube know this is a good video and it should recommend it to other hobbyists. If you'd also like to support the channel even further like these bloody legends, go check out AOS Coach on Patreon. Otherwise, don't forget your triumph.